Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about the Frontiersman. If you missed the video on the Trickster, I have a link for that in the top right hand corner. And as I said in that video, I am making a list of all of these explorations that come out of my own scholarship about the archetypes and sub-archetypes of modern day heroes and characters in our comics, films, and television. We talked about the Trickster and how he blurred boundaries. And the tricksters are important in culture to come about every now and then to change up some of the things we've accepted as tradition, our long-held beliefs, and blur the boundaries of some of our perceptions, and that causes us to question them and look at them anew. Sometimes we realize, yes, this is something we still want to hold to, and other times we realize it's something we want to think about a little bit differently. That is the use of a trickster through mythology. The Frontiersman is different, and the Frontiersman is uniquely relevant today in a lot of ways. If the trickster blurs boundaries, the Frontiersman straddles boundaries. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. A lot of cultures throughout time and across the world have had stories of explorers that go out in new lands and come back with their tales. They're always popular because they're exotic. They tend to be adventurous. But the American Frontiersman has a unique niche that's come to be the norm with our exportation of popular culture and Hollywood, in many ways anyway. The United States throughout history has had this idea of manifest destiny. And that was the idea from the very beginning of the colonies on the East Coast there, that they would one day extend the border of the United States all the way to the Pacific Coast. That that was just their destiny, their God-given destiny to own that land as the United States. Not every single politician or citizen at that point believed that, but that was just this general idea, and that's what you'll see it called in the history books, Manifest Destiny. Of course, in achieving that goal, many atrocities were committed. Horrible things were done to the American Indian tribes. It was not a fair play situation by any means. It's interesting, though, that the stories that still hold to our culture from that time period, our different points within those time periods, are not about the politicians. They're not the stories that glorify the generals. They're not those stories. And they, there have been stories like that. Andrew Jackson, for example, was a general who committed all kinds of horrible things against the American Indians and won a lot of victories against different tribes. And they tried to spin that into a mythos when he was running for president, and it, it worked even. He was elected president. But you don't know Andrew Jackson's name now unless you're interested in American history or you've ever looked very closely at a $20 bill. But frontiersmen do stay in the culture. People most likely know the name Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, Hawkeye from The Last of the Mohicans. Even though those first two were real characters in, in history, who didn't always act necessarily heroic in terms of the American monomyth, they've been mythologized to act that way. So there's a story in mythology that has been built up around them, and that fits into the mold. You would think that the frontier would be a territory for the trickster because it's a blurred boundary. This new land has been acquired somehow or another, and, but it's a blurred boundary. There are still tribes laying claims to it, and, and how are things going? And you're right, the frontiersman is a trickster territory in that manner, but the trickster creates that territory. The trickster can't make it safe. The frontiersman has to come in and make it safe because the frontiersman says, okay, we're not blurring the boundaries anymore. These two boundaries, these two peoples, these two ideologies, these two cultures, whatever the case may be, these two things exist. And they need to continue to exist as they are in themselves. They just have to do so together now. So that's what I mean by the frontiersman straddling boundaries. I'm saying a lot of abstract ideas here. Let me use a concrete example to explain what I mean. One of the works that I look at in my course when we look at the frontiersman, an early work anyway to get a basis, is The Last of the Mohicans that I mentioned. That book is sent during the French and Indian War. So we have the English colonists at the time that would later become the United States, they are battling the French who have recruited many of the American Indian tribes onto their side. A few tribes and a few natives will help out the English from time to time. So in the conflict of the French and Indian War in that book, we soon are introduced to Hawkeye, as he's called in this title. And he is a young English colonist, a young man who was raised for a certain portion of his life in the colony, but then was raised by the Delaware Indian tribe. And they raised him to adulthood, and he learned their ways of surviving, tracking, existing out in the woods, and so forth. And he becomes our frontiersman then because he straddles the boundary. 
The Frontiersman characters are important because they go out into that frontier, into that newly purchased or newly stolen piece of land or territory or whatever, and they, they're not out there to conquer anymore. They're not out there arguing for the justice of it being taken in the first place or anything. They're out there just to make it safe. And they bring safety to either settlers who are going out there to settle the land or the tribes out there who are still living in the land. They're a, they're a peacemaker. And they do this by straddling boundaries. In these strict frontiersman stories, they have one foot in the colonists or settlers world and they have another foot in the native tribes world. Hawkeye straddles boundaries in that he is a European, English colonist, but he was raised by the Delaware Indians. He makes a point a number of times throughout the book to call himself a man without a cross. And some people who try to read an agenda into the work or don't quite know any better, they will say that, oh, the man without a cross, he's saying that he's a man without religion. The real meaning of that, though, if you look at the context and you look at what he's saying, is he's pointing out time and again that he is not of both Native American blood and colonist or European blood. He is a man without a cross in his blood. He's a pure bred English colonist, but he was raised in the Delaware culture. You think, well, why does that matter so much? It matters because that would have made him a trickster. If he had those boundaries blurred within him, he doesn't. Instead, throughout the book, you will see him constantly ascribe certain things he does to either his European white colonist heritage or his Delaware Indian upbringing. He's pointing out that I can do this because of this, I can do that because of that. If he has the Mohicans around with him and it's time for tracking, he will allow them to go and he will defer to their authority on that because it's bred into their blood, you know, more so. And there is a subtle racism inherent in this idea, the racial pride or racial preference for gifts and so forth. There's a subtle racism built into that as well. But we're talking about a book that was written in the beginning of the United States history. So it was a book of his time. Having said that, though, it is a book ahead of its time in many ways in that it does present blurring of the bloodlines quite a bit. Cora, for example, is a strong, fascinating character in the book and moves and does a lot of things in the work. And she is revealed to be the daughter of her father, an English general, and one of his slaves that he'd had. And then she ends up developing a romance with Uncas, who is one of the Mohicans there with Hawkeye. So the book doesn't shy away from interracial relations by any means. But Hawkeye makes a point of saying this over and over because he's just demonstrating the fact that he is a frontiersman. He in himself is showing how these two cultures could exist together. They could use the strengths and weaknesses of each other. They could coexist were it not for the violence and the hatred and so forth. That is how the frontiersman straddles boundaries and doesn't blur them. Tarzan, another great frontiersman, because he is a Englishman of English blood in the novels, but he's raised by the apes in the jungle. So he has his foot in both of those worlds as well. And the books, and the books in particular, are very clear about saying he does this and this and this because of his human instincts, his instincts as being of this blood. But he does this and this and this because he was raised in the wild and by these beasts and knows their nature. So frontiersman characters continue to be popular, as I said, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone. Eventually, when the frontier was pushed to the West, then we had stories of the Wild West. Cowboys became our frontiersmen, and they're out there, the regulators. If you've ever seen Young Guns mythologizing the story of Billy the Kid in cohorts, that idea that we're here to regulate because injustice is being done out here, so we're here to, to make sure that stays clear. Even when they are deputized marshals or so forth within the American government, they're not government people. They are people who have the authority, they have that one foot in that world, like Wyatt Earp or someone like that, but then they also have the foot in the world of the Wild West. They understand the territory, they understand the culture, they can ally themselves with the Doc Holidays and so forth. So the cowboys became huge frontiersmen. Eventually the frontiersmen pushed all the way to the Pacific coast, and you might think, well, wouldn't that be the end of the frontiersmen stories? Not necessarily, because take the 50s and early 60s, for example. This was a time period when certainly frontiers had been reached in the world. But our culture, our science, our technology, society in general was on the verge of major breakthroughs. This was post-war, and there was a lot of optimism about the future and the futuristic world that was to come. And one of the ways to cope with that and to figure it out was for culture to turn back to those frontiersmen tales. Cowboy stories were immensely popular in the 50s and early 60s. Even old frontiersman stories. The Davy Crockett show was on 
and very popular at the time. There was even a television show of The Last of the Mohicans. Coupled with those stories were science fiction tales. But if you look at the science fiction tales, especially those Golden Age science fiction stories, they're frontiersman tales. They're cowboy stories set in space. You can't watch any episode of Star Trek, the original series, and tell me that Captain Kirk isn't just a cowboy wrangling his posse through uncharted territory. That's the formula. That's what people wanted to hear. Those are the types of stories that they were looking to to deal with and cope with all of these new changes that were coming into their culture. Not necessarily into their geography, but into their culture and into their technology and society in general. A frontiersman character will help them straddle those boundaries. Both of those types of stories are still popular today. In the comic books, you have frontiersmen everywhere. Green Lantern is the perfect comic book frontiersman. He has his foot firmly in the world of Earth and then firmly in the world of the Guardians out there in the galaxies. Speaking of Guardians and galaxies, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Peter Quill, a great frontiersman, has one foot firmly planted in American culture, as dated as it is, and then the other in the perils of space. Frontiersmen help us navigate new territory. They help us to straddle boundaries. And in straddling it, tricksters can be dangerous. Tricksters are useful, and we need tricksters. But if all you do is spend your time with a trickster, you don't have any solid ground to stand on. Tricksters shake things up, and that's necessary. But you need to transition at some point from a trickster to a frontiersman. And back again, of course. But you need to go back frontiersman and say, okay, things are shaking up a little bit. This is how I'm thinking of the world, or this is how I'm thinking of this thing, or whatever it is now. But now I'm going to need this frontiersman here to show me, okay, one foot goes firmly here and one foot goes firmly there. Because you can only wobble over a blurred boundary but so much before you fall down. There needs to be some concrete form to existence and to society. And to two different things, ideas, peoples, cultures, or whatever getting along and coexisting. The frontiersman is crucial to that. I will wrap this up here. Again, it's a heady topic. These are the topics that I can go into in far more depth and provide far more examples with in the book that I'm currently working on. And as I said again in the last video that I did, I am considering still making this book available through an Indiegogo project. I would have to find the right illustrator and get together the right set of perks and whatnot. So I would still like to hear from viewers if that's something you might be interested in or if I should perhaps go the traditional university press route. So let me know and keep an eye on my Twitter page for another poll to see which archetype I should cover next. And until then, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.